all of the following statements can be seen as logically implied by the arguments of the passage, except. Option one states, Freud's theory of aggression proposes that aggression results from the suppression of aggressive urges. Freud's theory is mentioned in the second paragraph, Sigmund Freud introduced here, and then the theory is mentioned. Sigmund Freud, 1930, proposed that all individuals are born with a death instinct that predisposes us to a variety of aggressive behaviors, including suicide, self-directed aggression, and mental illness, possibly due to an unhealthy or unnatural suppression of aggressive urges. So yes, aggression results from the suppression of aggressive urges was proposed by Freud's theory of aggression. This is true. So we can eliminate option one. Option two states, if the alleged aggressive act is not sought to be avoided, it cannot really be considered aggression. This can be seen from the first paragraph here. Generally, the victims of aggression must wish to avoid such behavior in order for it to be considered true aggression. So this also is true, two can be eliminated. Option three states, the Freudian theory of suicide as self-inflicted aggression implies that an aggressive act need not be sought to be avoided in order for it to be considered aggression. This is somewhat self-evident and we've already seen the reference. Sigmund Freud proposes that all individuals are born with a death instinct that predisposes us to a variety of aggressive behaviors, including suicide, self-directed aggression. Now, the point of this is that suicide or self-directed aggression, as mentioned here, would be something that the one who is, who is the perpetrator of the aggression will, need, will not necessarily seek to avoid it. One who commits suicide would be committing aggression against himself or herself. That person would not seek to avoid such aggression. So this is presented as an exception to what is mentioned in B and what we have seen as a reference in paragraph one. But this is true. So three can be avoided. Uh, three can be eliminated. Option four states, a common theory of aggression is that it is the result of an abnormally low natural uh, neural regulation of testosterone. This is incorrect. We can see it here from the second paragraph. Hormonal factors also appear to play a significant role in fostering aggressive tendencies. For example, the hormone testosterone has been shown to increase aggressive behavior when injected into animals. Men and women convicted of violent crimes also possess significantly higher levels of testosterone than men and women convicted of non-violent crimes. That means that aggression is a result of higher regulation of testosterone, not lower regulation of testosterone. So four is incorrect, hence four can be qualified. Our final answer is option four. The author discusses all of the following arguments in the passage, except that option one states, men in general are believed to be more hormonally driven to exhibit violence than women. This is true. We can see this from this line here near the end of the second paragraph. Numerous studies comparing different age groups, racial, ethnic groups, and cultures also indicate that men overall are more likely to engage in a variety of aggressive behaviors, example, sexual assault, aggravated assault, etc., than women. So this is true. We can eliminate option one. Option two states, the nature of aggression can vary depending on several factors, including intent. This we can see from the first paragraph, the first few lines. Aggression is any behavior that is directed towards injuring, harming, or inflicting pain on other living being or group of beings. On another living being or group of beings. Generally, the victims of aggression must wish to avoid such behavior in order for it to be considered true aggression. Aggression is also categorized according to its ultimate intent. So 
the nature of aggression can vary depending on factors mentioned here, including intent, as we see here. So this is also true. We can eliminate option two. Option three states, several studies indicate that aggression may have roots in the biological condition of humanity. This we can infer from the hormonal factors mentioned here, but there's a more direct reference. At the most basic level, some argue that aggressive urges and actions are a result of inborn biological factors. So this can directly be qualified according to the passage, hence three also is eliminated. Option four states, aggression in most societies is kept under control through moderating the death instinct identified by Freud. This is our answer because this is not, uh, this is a distortion of what is mentioned in the passage. We see the death instinct mentioned here. First, there is no mention of moderating the death instinct. Second, aggression is in most societies is kept under control through anything. Keeping aggression under control is also something which has not been discussed in the passage. So we can qualify option four. Thus our final answer is option four. An enemy combatant may be subjected to torture in order to extract useful intelligence, though those inflicting the torture may have no real feelings of anger or animosity towards their subject. Which one of the following best explicates the larger point being made by the author here? The given sentence, this given statement is here in the first paragraph, just following this reference. Instrumental aggression is an aggressive act that is regarded as a means to an end other than pain or injury. For example, an enemy combatant may be subjected to torture, though those inflicting the torture may have no real feelings of anger or animosity towards their subject. This is done in order to extract useful intelligence. This is a key statement. Let's check with the options. Option one states, the use of torture to extract information is most effective when the torturer is not emotionally involved in the torture. We don't have, we have read the references. We don't have any reference to torture being effective. So this is an assumption. This is outside the premise. This is clearly not the explanation that we are looking for. So one can be eliminated. Option two states, when an enemy combatant refuses to reveal information, the use of torture can sometimes involve real feelings of hostility. Again, it has not been discussed whether there is ever a possibility of real feelings of hostility. And then would it be a result of an enemy combatant refusing to reveal information? So this also is an assumption like option one, we can eliminate option two. Option three states, in certain kinds of aggression, inflicting pain is not the objective and is no more than a utilitarian means to achieve another end. This is perfect because we have seen that here in instrumental aggression, inflicting pain is not the objective. It is a utilitarian means to achieve another end. The the other end that we are talking about here is to extract useful intelligence. So three is quite true. We can qualify three. Option four states, information revealed by subjecting an enemy combatant to torture is not always reliable because of the animosity involved. Wrong. First, there is no animosity involved. We have seen it here. Second, the information revealed by the sub, uh, by subjecting an enemy combatant to torture is not always reliable. This also is an assumption. So we cannot qualify option four. Four can be eliminated. Thus our answer is option three. The author identifies three essential factors according to which theories of aggression, aggression are most commonly categorized. Which of the following options is closest to the factors identified by the author? This is a ridiculously easy question. We can see the three factors here. 
The first variable is the aggressor himself. The second is the social situation or circumstance in which the aggression, aggressive acts occur. The third variable is the target or victim of aggression. So if you were to simplify, we had three variables, the aggressor, the circumstance, the victim of aggression. So we just have to check the words. Option one states extreme, moderate, mild, no connection. We can eliminate option one. Option two states psychologically, sociologically, medically, again, no connection. So we can eliminate option two. Option three states aggressor, circumstance of aggression, victim. This is perfect. This is exactly what we were talking about. Aggressor, circumstance of aggression and the victim. So this is exactly what we were looking for. These are the three aspects, the three factors. So we can qualify option three as a valid answer. Option four states hostile, instrumental, hormonal. While these may be terms which are true according to the passage, we can see instrumental here, hormonal here, but then these don't connect with the premise at all. So option four can also be summarily eliminated. Our answer quite clearly is option three. We can deduce that the author believes that piracy can best be controlled in the long run. Option one states, through the extensive deployment of technology to track ships and cargo seems unlikely while we don't have any direct reference to um, technology deployment of technology. This is an inferential question. We can see here that at least one aspect of technology has been has been um, obviated. We see here such ships are costly and only solve the problem temporarily. Somali piracy is bound to return as soon as the warships are withdrawn. Robot shipping, eliminating hostages has been proposed as a possible solution. But as Lair points out, this will only make pirates switch their targets to smaller carriers unable to afford the technology. So techno uh, technological improvement is not presented as a very good choice. It has been obviated. One can be eliminated. One is not likely to be a solution. Two says, through international cooperation in enforcing stringent deterrence, still not very likely. We can see it from the last few lines. Diplomatic initiatives against piracy are plagued by mutual distrust. The Russians execute pirates, while the EU and US, European Union and the United States are reluctant to capture them for fear they'll claim asylum. So this also is not likely to be a solution. Two can be eliminated. Option three states, if we eliminate poverty and income disparity in affected regions, this is a valid uh, option. We can see it here. At least it has worked in at least one scenario. Investment in local welfare put a halt to Malaysian piracy in the 1970, but was dependent on money somehow filtering through a corrupt bureaucracy to the poor on the periphery. So it was... It was dependent on this, so it, it might have failed, but it did work for a while. Uh, put a halt to Malaysian piracy in the 1970s. So this is something which works. So in the long run, it can be implemented, and that might give a solution to piracy. So three is a valid answer. Option four says, through lucrative welfare schemes to improve the lives of people in affected regions. Very close to option three, but this says lucrative welfare schemes. But that's a distortion. We are talking about welfare, not necessarily welfare schemes. Welfare schemes is a little too specific. We have a better choice in option three. So we can clearly eliminate option four. Our answer is option three. Why toil away as a starving peasant in the 16th century when a successful pirate made up to 4,000 pounds on each raid? In this sentence, the author's tone can best be described as being. So option one states, indignant at the scale of wealth 
successful pirates could amass in medieval times. Now, the reference is here in the third paragraph. We can read these lines and see that there's no, there's no uh, indignancy. There's no, um, the author is not disturbed at anything. The main motive for piracy has always been a combination of need and greed. Why toil away as a starving peasant in the 16th century when a successful pirate made up to 4,000 pounds on each raid? Anyone could turn to freebooting if the rewards were worth worth the risk. So we don't see any kind of anger or displeasure being disturbed at anything. The author is not speaking out of out of um, any kind of distaste. So we can eliminate option one. Doesn't seem likely. Option two states, ironic about the reasons why so many took to piracy in medieval times. This is vague, but it is true. Ironic, yes, because the reason why so many took to piracy in medieval times was why at all uh, do hard work in the 16th century when pirates can make up so much make so much money anyone could turn to freebooting if the reward was worth the risk so this is somewhat vague but it functions like a decent enough answer so two can be qualified let's see if we can find a better answer option three says facetious about the hardships of peasant life in medieval england this can summarily be rejected because clearly the hardships of peasant life is not the key aspect here. Not at all the key aspect in the in the passage altogether. So we definitely have a better answer option in two. Comparatively, three can be eliminated. Option four states, analytical, to explain the contrast between peasant and pirate life in medieval England. Again, the contrast between peasant and pirate life is not the key aspect here. Here it is just a reference. Why be a peasant when you can be a pirate and earn so much? So this is also irrelevant. So we can eliminate option four. The answer is option two. A more eclectic history might have included the conquistadors, Vasco da Gama and the East India Company. But Lair sticks to the diagnosed a disorganized small fry. From this statement, we can infer that the author believes that the reference is in the second paragraph. We can see it here. A more eclectic history, so on, till small fry. So let's check with the options. Vasco da Gama and the East India Company laid the ground for modern piracy. No, this is, this is too extreme. What this paragraph does is that it puts a certain assessment, puts forward a certain assessment of piracy. Where does piracy begin or end? According to St. Augustine, a Corsair captain once told Alexander the Great that in the forceful acquisition of power and wealth at sea, the difference between an emperor and a pirate was simply one of scale. So, by this logic, European empire builders were the most successful pirates of all time. A more eclectic history might have included conquistadors, Vasco da Gama, and East India Company. But Lair sticks to the disorganized small fry. So Lair sticks to this idea. When, when Lair interprets this in a way that only, only the small fry, those who have lower scale of this acquisition of power and wealth would be considered pirates. Otherwise, by what St. Augustine said, anyone who has, who has acquired power, even if that were emperors or empires, would still be, could still be considered uh, a pirate. This does not mean it has absolutely... There is absolutely no reason to say that Vasco da Gama and East India Company laid the ground for modern piracy. The passage does not make any such claims. One can be eliminated. Option two states, 
the disorganized piracy of today is no match for the organized piracy of the past. We can see from the phrase the disorganized small fry that the aspect of disorganized modern piracy versus organized past piracy is outside the premise. There's no such reference, no such comparison. So two can be eliminated. Option three states, Lair does not assign adequate blame to empire builders for their past deeds, does not assign adequate blame. But by this aspect, we see that Lair sticks to the disorganized small fry. Lair does not hold European empire builders to be pirates. But then the, even the author does not necessarily call them pirates. The, the author says by this logic, according to what St. Augustine said, so it's not that the author is actually blaming empire builders of being of being pirates. So this is also a distortion. We can eliminate option three. Option four states, colonialism should be considered an organized form of piracy. Now in should be considered, we have something that at least agrees with St. Augustine. We have this year, by this logic, European empire builders were the most successful pirates of all time. So we can see that yes, colonialism could have could have been considered in a sense, it could have been considered an organized form of piracy. We have this as well here, the conquistadors, Vasco da Gama and East India Company, all examples of uh, col colonizers. So for is legitimate, we can qualify for our option is our answer is option four. The author ascribes the rise in piracy today to all of the following factors, except we have modern piracy or the present day rise in piracy discussed in the fourth and the fifth paragraphs. So we'll find the reference to the answer also in these paragraphs. Let's check with the options. The growth in international shipping with globalization. Increased globalization is mentioned here. This reference is here in the second line. A rise in global shipping has meant rich pickings for freebooters. And freebooters is a term that, as we see here, is used for basically, basically for pirates. So this is one of the reasons for the rise in piracy. One can be eliminated. Option two states the high rewards via ransoms for successful piracy attempts. This can be seen from the fifth paragraph. Modern pirates, uh, pirate prevention has failed after the French yacht Lagrono was ransomed for $2 million in 2008. Opportunists from all over Somalia flocked to the coast for a piece of the action. So this again is something which is a reason. We can eliminate option two. Option three states, decrease surveillance on the high seas. This is incorrect. We can see here a consistent rule even today is that is there are never enough warships to patrol pirate invest, infested waters. Such ships are costly and only solve the problem temporarily. Somali piracy is bound to return as soon as the warships are withdrawn, which means that there, there are inadequate number of ships to surveil the high seas, not that there is a decreased surveillance of the high seas. So three is a distortion from the passage. We can qualify three as a valid answer. Option four says, colonialism's disruption of historic ties among countries. This is a bit of a fleeting reference, but we can qualify this from two parts. We can see here, increased globalization has done more to encourage piracy than suppress it. European colonialism weakened delicate balances of power, leading to an influx of opportunists on the high seas. Skip a few lines ahead. It became uh, layer rights. It quickly becomes clear that in those parts of the world that have not profited from globalization and modernization and where abject poverty and daily struggle for survival are still a reality, the root cause of piracy are still the same as they were a couple of hundred years ago. So from these, we can, we can see that in essence, four is also true. So four can be eliminated. Hence, our answer is option three. 
which one of the following statements, if true, could be seen as the best supporting as best supporting the argument in the passage. Option one states, the production and distribution of renewable energy through small scale local systems is not economically sustainable. Now that we've seen the first option, we have to first, we have to go back and understand the question. It's a, it's a curveball question. The question asks, which of the following statements are among the options, if false, could be seen as best supporting the argument of the passage. So what we have to find is a statement or an option, which is against the information given in the passage, as in it weakens the argument of the passage. So in that case, if it were false, then that would strengthen the argument, support the argument of the passage. Anything which is supporting the argument um, of the passage or is strengthening the argument of the passage would not work as an answer because in that case, if it were false, then it would rather weaken the argument of the passage. We see hence that one is not, uh, not a potential answer. The production and distribution of renewable energy through small scale local systems is not economically sustainable. This is absolutely true. We have two references repeat references of this in the passage. The first one is here. Furthermore, although renewable energy can be produced and distributed through small scale local systems, such as such an approach might not generate the high returns on investment needed to attract capital. The second reference to this is here in the in the fourth paragraph, renewable energy can be produced at the household or neighborhood level. However, such small scale localized production is unlikely to generate high returns for investors. So this is true according to the passage, which means this if false would rather weaken the argument of the passage. Hence, one is not a potential answer, we can eliminate option one. Option two states, renewable energy systems have little or no environmental impact. This is against the passage, we can see it here in the first, second and third paragraphs, in fact, that environmental impact has been mentioned. When it starts with a question, it starts by questioning that whether there is environmental impact. So, but renewables need to be further scrutinized before being championed as forging a path towards a low carbon future. Both the direct and indirect impacts of renewable energy must be examined to ensure that a climate smart future does not intensify social and environmental harm. Immediately, it is stated that there is environmental harm as renewable energy production requires land, water and labor, among other inputs, it imposes cost on costs on people and the environment. This idea is further explored in hydropower projects and such. We can see from the second paragraph, it is stated, Renewables are enmeshed in long standing resource extraction through their dependence on minerals and metals. Scholars document the negative consequences of mining, even for mining operations that commit to socially responsible practices. Many of the world's largest reservoirs of minerals like cobalt, copper, lithium, and rare earth minerals, the ones needed for renewable technologies, are found in fragile states and under communities of marginalized people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Again, in the third paragraph, we see that devices developed to reduce our carbon footprint, such as lithium batteries for hybrid and electric cars or solar panels become potentially dangerous electronic waste at the end of their productive, uh, productive life. The disposal of toxic waste has long perpetuated social injustice through the flows of waste to the global south and to marginalized communities in the global north. So we find that there is considerable environmental impact of renewable energy systems, which means option two, which says these systems have little or no environmental impact is incorrect. It is against the argument of the passage. It is weakening the argument of the passage, which means if it were false, then it would rather strengthen the argument of the passage. So we could generalize from all the references that we've seen 
make this false and say renewable energy systems have environmental impact, significant environmental impact. So two is a valid answer option. We can qualify two. Option three states, renewable energy systems are as expensive as non-renewable energy systems. Now, the aspect of expense of renewable versus non-renewable systems is outside the premise. There is no direct reference to it. We have financial ramifications mentioned in the passage, discussed in the passage, sure. Some in the first paragraph, largely in the fourth paragraph. But directly the expense of these two systems or expense of Im implementing these systems are not discussed. So we cannot accept three to make it false, whether it will strengthen or weaken the argument, whether it will support or not support or go against the argument in the passage, that cannot be said definitively. So we cannot commit anything to option three. Three can be eliminated. It's too vague to be an answer. Four says, renewable energy systems are not as profitable as non-renewable energy systems. Yes, the same reference as option one, we can see that these references also work for option four. So when option four says renewable energy systems are not as profitable as non-renewable energy systems, at least in the context of small scale localized production, we see that this is absolutely true as per the information given the passage, which means that this is also uh, this is also not a potential answer, because if we were to make this false, it will go against the information given in the passage. So four can be eliminated. Our answer we see is option two. Which one of the following statements, if true, could be an accurate inference from the first paragraph of the passage? Option one states, the author has reservations about the consequences of non-renewable energy systems. This is outside the premise. We can see that the author makes reference to renewable uh, energy systems and their implications or consequences. We don't have the aspect of non-renewable energy sources or energy systems. So we cannot, we cannot accept this. One can be eliminated. Option two states, the author's only reservations about the profitability of renewable energy systems. Incorrect. We have a key statement here. This says, but renewables need to be further scrutinized before being championed as forging a path towards toward a low carbon future. Both the direct and indirect impacts of renewable energy must be examined to ensure that a climate smart future does not intensify social and environmental harm. Yes, the profitability is mentioned. It is mentioned here in this line. The last statement, but that is not the only concern. The only reservation, there are others. So this also is incorrect. We can eliminate option two. Option three states, the author has a reservation about reservations about the consequences of renewable energy systems. This is perfect. We just saw the references. The con consequences men are mentioned here. And then also the, the low profitability, at least in the small scale local systems, local uh, systems level can also be a consequence. Yes. So this is definitely true. We can qualify three as a valid answer. Option four states, the authority does, the author does not think renewable energy systems can be as efficient as non-renewable energy systems. Now, while we were talking about um, the impacts, the consequences, the profitability, efficiency was not discussed. Efficiency is outside the premise. And so we can also eliminate option four. Thus, our answer is option three. Which one of the following statements best captures the main argument of the last paragraph of the passage? Option one states, most forms of renewable energy are not profitable investments for uh, invest institutional investors. This is a distortion. We can see here that it is only true in the case of uh, small scale production. 
Renewable energy can be produced at the household or neighborhood level. However, such small scale localized production is unlikely to generate high returns for investors. So this is not exactly correct. We can eliminate option one. Option two states, renewable energy systems are not democratic unless they are corporate controlled. This also is a distortion. We can see the aspect of democratic or democratized here in the third and the fourth line. What is mentioned is for some climate activists, the promise of renewables, uh, renewables recess, uh, rests on their ability not only to reduce emissions, but also to provide distributed democratized access to energy. But Burke and Stephens caution that renewable energy systems offer a possibility, but not a certainty for more democratic energy futures, and then so on. So yet again, this is not true that they can only be democratic if they are corporate controlled, quite the opposite. So we can eliminate option two. Option three states, renewable energy produced, produced at the household or neighborhood level is more efficient than mass produced forms of energy. Uh, yet again, the aspect of efficiency is completely outside the premise. There's no such discussion, no such reference in the in the passage. We were talking about uh, these being less profitable comparatively, the renewable energy being less profitable at the household or neighborhood levels, but more efficient cannot be said. So three is vague. We can eliminate option three. Option four states, the development of the renewable energy sector is a double edged sword. A very general statement, but this one can be inferred. This one can be qualified. We can see here, we've seen half the reference already. For some climate activists, the promise of renewables rests on their ability not only to reduce emissions, but also to provide distributed democratized access to energy. Now, what does democratized access to energy mean? It means as democratic means for everyone. So everyone will be able to access the production of energy by these means, but that is not necessarily true. The following statement then puts doubt, uh, puts this assertion into doubt. But Burke and Stephens caution that renewable energy systems offer a possibility, but not a certainty for more democratic energy futures. Small scale distributed forms of energy are only highly profitable to institutional investors if control is consolidated somewhere in the financial chain. Renewable energy can be produced at the household or neighborhood level. However, such small scale localized production is unlikely to generate high returns for investors. For financial growth to be sustained and expanded by the renewable sector, production and trade in renewable energy technologies will need to be highly concentrated and large asset management firms will likely drive those developments. So while the expectation is that of more democratic energy futures or democratized energy, energy access, there's only a possibility, not a certainty of this. And in all probability, as this last statement suggests, the large asset management firms or large companies, let's call them simplify, are likely to drive the developments and the progress of the renewable sector. So it will not be democratic access for everyone. So it's a double edged sword, it might just have disadvantages. Four is inferable. So we can qualify four as a valid answer. Our final answer is option four. All of the following statements, if true, could be seen as supporting the arguments in the passage, except option one states, the possible negative impacts of renewable energy need to be studied before it can be offered as a financial investment opportunity. Now, this is a distortion. We have these two aspects, both of them in the passage the possible negative impacts of renewable energy and its offering as financial investment opportunity. But these are not interconnected. Need to be studied before it can be is 
the assumption here. We have the aspect of negative impacts here in the first paragraph. It says, but renewables need to be further scrutinized before being championed as forging a path towards a, toward a low carbon future. Both the direct and indirect impacts of renewable energy must be examined to ensure that a climate smart future does not intensify social and environmental harm. Then again, we have the aspect of financial investment opportunity here in the fourth paragraph. While renewable energy is a more recent addition to financial portfolios, investments in the sector must be considered in light of our understanding of capital accumulation. So these two concepts are not directly related the way this option defines them to be. So we can see that this is not something which supports the argument of the passage. So we can mark one as a valid answer. Option two states, marginalized people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America have often been the main sufferers of corporate mining extraction projects, corporate mineral extraction projects. This is also there. This is there in the passage. We can see this from the second paragraph. Although an emerging sector, renewables are enmeshed in long-standing resource extraction through their dependence on minerals and metals. Scholars document the negative consequences of mining, even for mining operations that commit to socially responsible practices. Many of the world's largest reservoirs of minerals like cobalt, co uh, copper, lithium, and rare earth minerals, the ones needed for renewable technologies, are found in fragile states and under communities of marginalized people, peoples in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, since the demand for metals and minerals will increase substantially in a renewable powered future. This intensification could exacerbate the existing consequences of extractive activities. So it is the marginalized people. And in these countries, as they have been stated here, who have suffered because of corporate mineral extraction projects or mining projects. So this is something which is supported by the passage. We can eliminate option two. Option three states, the example of agricultural finance helps us to see how to concentrate corporate activity in the renewable energy sector. This is a reference from the fourth paragraph as Agricultural finance reveals the concentration of control of corporate activity facilitates profit generation for some climate activists. So we can see that this particular example helps us see how to concentrate corporate activity in renewable energy sector. So we see the concentration of control of corporate activity for profit generation. And this is connected to renewable energy here in the first line of this paragraph. So yet again, this is something which is supported by the passage. Three can be eliminated. Option four states, one reason for the perpetuation of social injustice lies in the problem of disposal of toxic waste. This is a direct reference. We can see it here. The disposal of toxic waste has long perpetuated social injustice through the flows of waste to the global south and to marginalized communities in global in the global north. So this also can be eliminated. Our answer here is option one. Based on the passage, we can infer that the author would be most supportive of which one of the following practices. Option one states the study of the coexistence of marginalized people with their environments. This is irrelevant to the passage altogether, because we have seen the aspect of the marginalized people mentioned in the second paragraph, but it's not their co coexistence with their environment, which is being talked about. The reference is to corporate practices of mineral extraction or mining activities. It is stated here, renewables are enmeshed in long standing resource extraction through their Dependence on minerals and metals, scholars document that the negative consequences of mining, even for mining operations that commit to socially responsible practices, 
many of the world's largest reservoirs of minerals, the ones needed for renewable technologies, are found under communities of marginalized people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So it is these people who have suffered because of the mining operations. Their coexistence with their environment is of no concern to us. It is outside the premise of the passage. So one can be eliminated. Option two states, more stringent global policies and regulations to ensure a more just system of toxic waste disposal. This is perfect. We just saw the reference to metals and minerals. The reference to toxic waste disposal is also given here. It is also connected to the marginalized communities. It is in the third paragraph where we see devices developed to reduce our carbon footprint, such as lithium batteries for hybrid and electric cars or solar panels become potentially dangerous electronic waste at the end of their productive life. The disposal of toxic waste has long perpetuated social injustice through the flows of waste to the global south and to marginalized communities in the global north. So a more just system of waste disposal, toxic waste disposal, where these marginalized communities, the global south and the communities, marginalized communities in the global north, these are not hurt by toxic waste disposal. The, the waste disposal could be could be um, reasonably and and um, and done in a proper way. So two is a valid answer. We can qualify two. Option three states encouragement for the development of more environment uh, environment friendly carbon based fuels. This is something which has also not been discussed in the passage. We hear about the author's views on renewable energy, but non-renewable energy systems or the development of environment-friendly carbon-based fuels, carbon-based fuels, which would not be uh, damaging to the environment, that has not been given. So again, we cannot, we cannot comment on this. We cannot qualify this as supportive of the, of the author's argument or whether or, or we couldn't infer whether the author would support this or not, because this view is just not known to us. So three can be eliminated. Option four states, the localized small scale development of renewable energy systems. This is uh, almost directly incorrect because the localized small scale production or development of renewable energy systems will not generate high returns for investors. There are two references to this in the passage. So this is something that the author has absolutely no reason to endorse or to be supportive of. So four can be eliminated. Our answer is option two. No amount of social analysis can account fully for the existence of Michelangelo or Leonardo. In light of the passage, which one of the following interpretations of this sentence is the most accurate? Option one states, no analysis, analyses exist of Michelangelo's or Leonardo's social accounts. Calm down. This is not talking about their social networking accounts, hashtag Facebook, not that. The reference to this is here in the third paragraph. We can see the line mentioned at the end. So it is stated here, but study of the critical artistic and popular reception of works by such artists as Michelangelo and Leonardo can shed important light on the meaning of these artists and their work for many different people. And the history of meaning making has a great deal to do with how scholars as well as lay audiences today understand these artists and their achievements. We can see the reference directly here. No amount of social analysis can account fully for the existence of Michelangelo or Leonardo. The key to answering this question in, in, is in this statement, just preceding the reference. If scholars engaged in this enterprise inquire, about, uh, inquire what makes an image beautiful or why this image or that constitutes a masterpiece or a work of genius, notice the phrase, masterpiece and work of genius. 
they should do so with the purpose of investigating an artist's or a work's contribution to the experience of beauty, taste, value, or genius. Yet again, we see the word genius repeated. Why is a is an image a masterpiece or a work of genius? What contributes to its beauty, taste, or value, or genius? This is the reference. We can see that one does not connect with this. So as we just now noticed, it is not about their social social network accounts. No, rather the, their social description. But Michelangelo and Leonardo's social description, what has that got to do with images? The primary aspect here is, is images, imagery. So this we find is irrelevant to the premise of the question. We can eliminate option one. Option two states, social analytical accounts of people like Michelangelo or Leonardo cannot explain their genius. This is perfect. What this statement, the one where we found the key says is that it is important for scholars to inquire what makes an image beautiful, why this image or that constitutes a masterpiece or a work of genius, what contributes to an artist's or a work's experience of beauty, taste, value or genius. And then we have the reference and the line that we had we had highlighted before the study of the critical at artistic and popular reception of works by such artists as Michelangelo and Leonardo can shed important light on the meaning of these artists and their work works for many different people, which means that this is almost correct. Some analytical accounts, social analytical accounts of people like Michelangelo or Leonardo cannot explain their genius. It can only help people understand their work to some extent. It is mandatory that their work be analyzed according to this particular aspect. What constitutes the, the image, the visual practice of the image itself. So we find that two connects, although inferentially, but it does. So two is a valid answer. You can qualify two. Option three states, Michelangelo or Leonardo cannot be subjected to social analysis because of their genius. But this is taking it a little too far. This is an exaggeration. They cannot be subjected to social analysis because of their genius. We can't say that. There is genius. In order to understand that genius, we have to basically analyze their work. We have to analyze the visual practice of the images that they have produced. These accounts, they don't exist. They cannot explain their genius, but we can at least analyze them to learn their process. So we find that three is comparatively weaker. Three can be eliminated. Option four states, socially existing beings cannot be analyzed, unlike the art of Michelangelo or Leonardo, which can. Again, something which is completely outside the premise, socially existing beings, and then the assumption cannot be analyzed. How do we say that? Where is the reference to that? We don't have anything such to qualify this option. Four can be eliminated. Thus, our answer is option two. Agreed. This is quite inferential. It does not directly, uh, directly uh, boil down from the passage or it cannot be directly found, even inferred from the passage. But we can see that this to an extent functions along with the passage, while the other options, they can be eliminated. They don't, they don't fit with the passage or they don't connect to anything in the passage. So we find that not the perfect answer, but the most appropriate answer here, the only one possible is option two. So that is our final answer. All of the following statements may be considered valid inferences from the passage, except option one states, artifacts are meaningful precisely because they help to construct the meanings of the world for us. This we can infer from the fourth paragraph. The reference to artifacts is here in the second line. The first line gives us the explanation for this. Scholars studying visual culture might properly focus their interpretative work on life worlds by examining images, practices, visual technologies, tastes, and artistic style as constitutive of social relations. The task is to understand how artifacts contribute to the construction of, of a world. 
Now it is these, the images, practices, visual technologies, taste, artistic style, which are called artifacts. And the requirement is why this is significant because these contribute to the construction of the of a world or they help to construct the meaning of the world. So this is true according to the passage. We can infer this from the passage. So one can be eliminated. Option two states, visual culture is not just about how we see, but also about how our visual practices can impact and change the world. This we can find from the third paragraph. The study of visual culture must scrutinize visual practice as much as image the images themselves, asking what images do when they are put to use. So basically we find that visual practices, their impact is emphasized in this paragraph. So this reference is also something which is true according to the passage can be inferred. So two can be eliminated. Option three states, studying visual culture requires institutional structures without which the structures of perception cannot be analyzed. Now perception or structures of perception is something which we find in the fifth paragraph. We can see it here. That is the structures of perception as a physiological process, as well as the epistemological frameworks informing a system of visual representation. Scholars may learn a great deal when they scrutinize the constituents of vision. So vision and, and structures of perception. So there are, we, we come across two problems with this particular option. First, visual culture is something that we find in the third paragraph. It is not directly connected. We, we see it here in the fourth paragraph as well, but we don't see reference to that here in the fifth paragraph. So one, this is not exactly connected, not directly connected at least. Second, we have institutional structures that is not present in any of these paragraphs. In fact, that is a reference which is outside the premise. So we don't need institutional structures, at least not according to the according to the passage. So this is something which is which is not inferable, not a valid inference from the passage. So we can qualify three as a valid answer. Option four states, understanding the structures of perception is an important part of understanding how visual cultures work. Again, structures of perception, we can mention, we've seen it here, a physiological process as well as the epistemological frameworks in forming a system of visual representation. So basically understanding the structures of perception, which is a part of or constituent of vision is an important part of understanding how visual culture works. So all right, we have our previous doubt addressed. Visual culture is connected with structures of perception and constituents of vision. All right, but doesn't make a difference. We still have institutional structures in three, which is outside the premise. So we find that four also is true according to the passage. We can eliminate option four and hence our answer is option three. Which set of keywords below most closely captures the argument of the passage? In a question like this, it is always a good idea to match the keywords with the passage and find out the frequency of their occurrence. We can check from option one, visual culture, aesthetic value, lay audience, visual experience. We don't need to check the entire option. We can check with lay audience. Lay audiences are mentioned here. And we find from this statement that lay audiences is a very minor aspect of this passage. So while visual culture, let's say, it makes an appearance in at least three to four paragraphs. Lay audiences doesn't. Lay audiences extremely limited. So this option seems to be extremely limited. We can eliminate option one. Option two states, scholars, social analysis, Michelangelo and Leonardo, interpretive devices. Now, 
again, we don't have to check the entire option. We can check Michelangelo and Leonardo. Michelangelo and Leonardo make exactly two appearances in the par in the passage. This is in the third paragraph here. The first one is here. The second one is here. And then again, we realize as we read this paragraph that Michelangelo and Leonardo, they are used as an example. Their genius is mentioned in order to, to emphasize the value of scrutinizing visual practice. The key aspect is visual practice, visual culture, not Michelangelo and Leonardo. So again, this is a little too limited, focuses on minor details, so two can be eliminated. Option three states, imagery, visual practices, life worlds, structures of perception. This sounds good. So here we check against all the given phrases. Imagery is supremely important. Not only do we see images mentioned in the first paragraph, we see imagery directly mentioned in the second paragraph. And then we see while the rest of the passage talks about images, imagery, which basically gives the system of analyzing images or portraying images. That is the central idea of the entire passage. So this is very important. Visual practices makes, makes an appearance in two paragraphs. We see visual construction of reality. Uh, side mentioned here, we have visual practices practice here. And then we can see there are other references to visual practice again. So visual practice is also an important aspect. Then we have life worlds. Life worlds is one aspect, a representative aspect of the examination of images. As mentioned here, with the, with the emphasis or with the task of studying visual culture, focusing on interpretative work. So we see that this is an important aspect. Life worlds is an important aspect from this, the fourth paragraph. We have structures of perception, which is mentioned here and connects with constituents of vision. So again, these are all key aspects. We see that all the four aspects here are quite important. There's references all across the passage. And unlike the previous two options, none of these are minor aspects or minor issues. They come in at the beginning of a paragraph. Let's say we are talking about life worlds. Life worlds is, is mentioned here where the paragraph is trying to est establish its key subject. Similarly, structures of perception here. This, in fact, connects with constituents of vision, perception and vision, you see. And so this basically is the major argument of, of this, the fifth paragraph. So this is a very good option. This covers the entire passage and its major aspects. And this is better than at least one and two comparatively. So we can qualify three as a valid answer. Let's see if we can find something better in four. Four states, visual construction of reality, work of genius, ethnography, and epiphenomena. Now in the last two options, we again see it reverting back to something which is minor. First off, we have ethnography here. Ethnography and reception studies become productive forms of gathering information. We realize not only is this one aspect of two, which are given in a certain context. Second, it is, these are forms of gathering information. They don't directly relate with images or imagery. So again, in ethnography, we have a limited, um, limited aspect, which connects to a minor factor, a minor issue in the passage. And then in epiphenomena, we have something which is, again, a very passing reference. We see here that the importance is of evidence, not epiphenomena. 
the last paragraph states the scholar of visual culture seeks to regard images as evidence for explanation not as epiphenomena so how can epiphenomena represent the a major argument of the passage it is something which is which is directly obviated which is negated this is not that so how can that be the key aspect here doesn't work we have we still have three comparatively the best option you see this kind of question will always have a comparative answer nothing can be perfect you add one more word to a otherwise to an otherwise perfect uh, perfect answer option and you'll get an even better answer option so the best option here is 3 4 compared to 3 is inferior we saw why we get eliminate 4 thus we get the answer as option 3 which one of the following best describes the word epiphenomena in the last sentence of the passage now this is a rather dramatic question albeit not a very difficult one so it can actually quite easily be analyzed we see the last paragraph the sixth one is a one sentence paragraph it says here finally the scholar of visual culture seeks to regard images as evidence for explanation not as epiphenomena while the meaning of epiphenomena is not directly given we can see that visual a scholar of visual culture seeks to regard images as this and not that which means epiphenomena is opposed to evidence for explanation so whatever epiphenomena is it is something which is which has an antonymous meaning or essence or sense as compared to evidence for explanation let's see which option gives us such a reference option a states phenomena amenable to analysis no reference to analysis no reference to phenomena epiphenomena relates to phenomena that's quite a silly thing to do so one cannot be justified we can eliminate this option option 2 states overarching collection of images we see seeks to regard images as so images are mentioned but overarching collection no reference here again a little too strong an exaggeration so two can also be eliminated option 3 states phenomena supplemental to the evidence this is perfect this is exactly what we were looking for so evidence for explanation that was what we were say, uh, what we analyzed to be opposite to opposed to epiphenomena so what is epiphenomena phenomena supplemental to additional to the evidence forget the word phenomena not required supplemental to the evidence which means something which is additional to the evidence and evidence is something which is opposed to epiphenomena so what can be the potential meaning this even if we don't know the word it's highly probable that we don't know know the word this still gives us a close enough reference we can say that this is a valid enough answer now we are still shooting in the dark we have hit something we don't know if it's our target so let's check with 4 and only then let's come back to 3 4 says visual phenomena of epic proportions again so we have come to phenomena visual phenomena also we can understand because we can infer because we are talking about visual culture here but epic proportions where do we see anything of epic proportions epic proportions large huge grand scale no such reference so again we don't have any logic to qualify option 4 4 can most certainly be eliminated so what must be the answer there has to be an answer the only possible answer is option 3 and thus you can eliminate the rest of the answers our answer is option 3 seeing operates on the foundation of covenants with images that establish the condition conditions for meaningful visual experience in light of the passage which one of the following statements best conveys the meaning of the sentence 
the sentence is here at the end of the fifth paragraph. Seeing operates on the foundation of covenants with images that establish the conditions for meaningful visual experience. A part of this can be understood from this sentence itself. Another part of it can be understood from the statements preceding it. Scholars may learn a great deal when they scrutinize the constituents of vision, that is, the structures of perception as a physiological process, as well as the epistemological, meaning related or origin related framework informing a system of visual representation. Vision is a socially and biologically constructed operation, depending on the design of the human body and how it engages the interpretive devices developed by a culture in order to see intelligibly. Seeing operates on the foundation of covenants, covenants agreements with images. So seeing operations on the foundation with agreement with images or, or sort of a, a kind of a tie up, if, if that can be called between the, uh, the faculty of vision and images that establish the conditions for meaningful visual experience. So there is a connection between seeing and images. Uh, and that is what helps us in drawing meaningful visual experiences. So let's check with the options. Option one states, sight as the meaningful visual experience is possible when there is a foundational condition established in images of governance. This is extremely difficult language. The paragraph, the passage itself as, as such is quite complex. The options even more so. We don't need to analyze the entire thing. Focus on a small part established in images of governance. Wrong. There is an agreement between seeing vision and images, but that doesn't mean we have images of agreements. Completely incorrect. So we can definitely eliminate option one. Option one is out. Option two states, sight becomes a meaningful visual experience because of covenants of meaningfulness that we establish with the images we see. This makes sense. So we can analyze it a little slower. Sight becomes a meaningful visual experience. Yes, sight, foundation of establish the condition for me meaningful visual experience because of covenants of meaningfulness, because of covenants agreements that we establish with images we see. So agreements with images makes complete sense. This is just a restatement, a rephrasing of, in essence, what is given in this given reference. So two seems like a valid answer. Let's check with the rest. Three states, the way we experience sight is through images operated on by meaningful covenants. This also is a distortion. Again, we can analyze a little slowly because what we could do in one doesn't necessarily work here. So the way we experience sight is through images operated on by meaningful covenants. The last part is completely incorrect. We don't experience sight through images. We experience or we have visual experiences through a covenant between sight and images. So the first part is definitely a distortion. Second, operated on by meaningful covenants. Again, this, this takes uh, covenant outside of the equation, makes it a third party. So when covenants from the outside come and operate on, on vision, on images, we begin to have sight completely wrong. There is a covenant between vision and image. And that is why we have visual experience. So this does not make any sense at all. Three can be eliminated. Option four states, images are meaningful visual experiences. When they have a foundation of covenants, seeing them again, a distortion. By this point, we have started to understand the logic. Images are meaningful visual experiences. Maybe this 
is also a distortion. We, we had said that meaningful visual experiences happen because of coverance between seeing and images. Then it says images are meaningful visual experiences. All right, probably. When they have a foundation of covenant seeing them, no. When we are seeing them and when there is a covenant and agreement between image and seeing, then we have meaningful visual experiences. So even if we were to be very generous and allow the first part of this option, the second part of this option cannot be justified at all. So we can eliminate option four Thus, our answer is option two. The passage states, all humans make decisions based on one or a combination of two factors. This is either intuition or information. Decisions made through intuition are usually fast. People don't even think about the problem. It is quite philosophical, meaning that someone who made a decision based on intuition will have difficulty explaining the reasoning behind it. The decision maker would often utilize her senses in drawing conclusions, which again is based on some experience in the field of study. On the other side, the spectrum, on the other side of the spectrum, we have decisions made based on information. These decisions are rational. It is based on facts and figures, which unfortunately also means that it can be quite slow. The decision maker would frequently use reports, analyses, and indicators to form her conclusion. This methodology results in accurate, quantifiable decisions, meaning that a person can clearly explain the rationale behind it. So we have one distinction which gives us two aspects. We have the factors which affect decision making, human decision making. And these two factors are intuition or information. We have decisions based on intuition, which are usually fast, and people don't even think about the problem. It is philosophical, meaning that someone who's made a decision based on intuition will have difficulty explaining the reasoning behind it. On the other side, we have decisions based on information. These decisions are rational. They're based on facts and figures which also means that they can be quite slow. The decision maker would frequently use reports, analyses, and indicators to form the conclusions. This methodology results in accurate quantifiable decisions, meaning that a person can clearly explain the rationale behind it. So let's check with the options. Option one states, it is better to make decisions based on information because it is more accurate and the rationale behind it can be explained. We have two problems with this. First, it's an assumption to say it is better to make decisions based on information. Yes, decisions based on information are called more accurate. They result in accurate decisions, but that's not the issue. The issue is that these are quantifiable. They're quantifiable and hence, they might take time, but the person who made the decision might be able to, will usually be able to explain the rationale, the thought process behind taking the decision. So to say that it is better to make decisions based on information is an assumption. The passage doesn't actually say that. Even then, we can see that this is still limited because it omits the aspect of decision making based on intuition. So this is clearly not the best summary, we can eliminate option one. Option two states, while decisions based on intuition can be made fast, the reasons that led to these cannot be spelt out. All true according to with respect to decisions based on intuition. But this again is limited because it omits decisions based on information. So we can again eliminate option two. Option three states, decisions based on intuition and information result in differential speed and ability to provide a rationale. This is perfect, the most balanced. We see decisions based on one, intuition, and two, information result in different speeds. 
So one would be faster, the other would be slower. And ability to provide a rationale. In one case, the decision maker would be able to provide a rationale why she made a decision. In the other case, they wouldn't be. So this covers the largest aspect of the, of the given passage. Hence, three is a valid choice. Option four states, we make decisions based on intuition or information on the basis of time available. This is a distortion. We don't make decisions based on intuition or information. It is not intuition or information on the basis of time available. It is rather the other way around. How much time is taken to take the decision based on whether it was based on intuition or information. So this flips the argument and hence it cannot be a valid summary. So four can be eliminated. Our answer, the best summary is three. The passage states, with the Treaty of Westphalia, the papacy had been confined to ecclesiastical functions and the doctrine of sovereign equality reigned. What political theory could then explain the origin and justify the functions of secular political order? In his Leviathan, published in 1651, three years after the Peace of Westphalia, Thomas Hobbes provided such a theory. He imagined a state of nature in the past when the absence of authority produced a war of all against all. To escape such intolerable insecurity, he theorized, people delivered their rights to a sovereign power in return for, their, for the sovereign's provision of security for all within the state's border. The sovereign state's monopoly on power was established as the only way to overcome the perpetual fear of violent death and war. Now let's check with the options. Option one states, Thomas Hobbes theorized the voluntary surrender of rights by people as essential for emergence of sovereign states. Now, this is okay. This is not a bad option, but it has an indirect connection. We have Thomas Hobbes theorized the voluntary surrender of rights by people as essential for emergence of sovereign states. Not exactly true. While we'll see that... Um, here we we talk about in the passage, we talk about the sovereign state's monopoly on power was established as the only way to overcome the perpetual fear of violent death and war. And this was done by the people delivering their rights to a sovereign power in return for the provision of security. So this jumps one step in between. It jumps the aspect of monopoly, but still... Overall, it covers a key aspect, one key aspect. So we might qualify one. One is an okay answer. It's a decent answer. Let's see if we can find something better because this is extremely limited. Two states, Thomas Hobbes theorized the emergence of sovereign states based on transactional relationship between people and sovereign state that was necessitated by a sense of insecurity of the people We'll see in comparison to one, this is much better. We have the aspect of Thomas Hobbes providing such a theory or making a prediction or theorizing the emergence of sovereign states. Imagine a state of nature in the past when the absence of authority produced a war of all against all. To escape such intolerable insecurity, he theorized people delivered their rights to a sovereign power in return for the sovereign's provision of security for all within the state's border. That means that we can qualify this aspect of a transactional relationship between people and a sovereign state that was necessitated by a sense of insecurity. While insecurity is directly mentioned, we have to escape such insecurity, he theorized, people delivered their rights to sovereign power in return for the sovereign's provision of security. So. The rights were given up to a sovereign power in return for security, provision of security, and that too within all, to all within the state's border. 
So we see that the transactional relationship is actually qualified. This was that was necessitated by a sense of insecurity or insecurity of the people. Yes, the sovereign state's monopoly on power was established as the only way to overcome the perpetual fear of violent death and war. So we see not only does this completely agree with the passage, also that this is a much better and more comprehensive summary than option one. So now we can qualify option two as a better answer. In comparison, we can eliminate option one because we have found a better answer. Let's check and see if we can find something even better than two. Three says, Thomas Hobbes theorized that sovereign states emerged out of people's voluntary desire to overcome the sense of insecurity and establish the doctrine of sovereign equality. But this is incorrect. The doctrine of sovereign equality is mentioned here in the first line. The doctrine of sovereign equality reigned. This was after the Treaty of Westphalia. Now, we can see that, again, in comparison to two, we can see that three is a weak option. It's an inferior option because we have Thomas Hobbes, which is important, theorized that sovereign states emerged out of people's voluntary desire to overcome the sense of insecurity and establish the doctrine of sovereign equality. Two problems. First, the people did desire to overcome the sense of insecurity. We see that here, definitely. But did they have, did they uh, desire to establish the doctrine of sovereign equality? No such reference has been made. It is stated and the doctrine of sovereign equality reigned after the Treaty of Westphalia. So this was a change made there. It was not that the people wanted that such, such a thing should happen. This is a distortion, first. And second, the Treaty of Westphalia, the papacy, and the doctrine of sovereign equality are used as examples here. They build towards the theory, the significance of the theory proposed by Thomas Hobbes. So this is of lesser importance than what we have here, necessitated by a sense of uh, insecurity by the people. So we realize that three is inferior as compared to two. We can eliminate option three. Option four states, Thomas Hobbes theorized the emergence of sovereign states as a form of transactional governance to limit the power of the papacy. Yet again, this uh, four goes even further down the rabbit hole, the same problem as option three. The emergence of sovereign states is a form of transactional governance. All right, we could we could check that. We have checked that. But to limit the power of the papacy, the emergence of the sovereign states here, as mentioned in the last few lines, did not have anything to directly do, do with the papacy. To limit the power of the papacy and uh, and such, this was this was a result of the Treaty of Westphalia, not a desire of the people. So as we have done for three, we can also eliminate option four. Thus, our final answer is option two. The passage states, the dominant hypotheses in modern science believe that language evolved to allow humans to exchange factual information about the physical world. But an alternative view is that language evolved in modern humans, at least to facilitate social bonding. It increased our ancestors' chances of, surviving, uh, of survival by enabling them to hunt more successfully or to cooperate more extensively. Language meant that things could be explained and that plans and past experiences could be shared efficiently. So let's check with the options. Option one states, from the belief that humans invented language to process factual information, scholars now think that language was the outcome of the need to ensure social cohesion and human survival. We see that this is okay. This is not wrong per se, but there are a few levels of inference here. From, from the belief that humans invented language, humans invented language, rather it is mentioned that language evolved to allow humans. So this is not exactly true. Of course, we understand that language did not invent itself. 
humans did invent language. We can see if we find no better option, this might be our answer. To process factual information, this is in line with exchanging factual information. Scholars now think that language was the outcome of the need to ensure social cohesion. Again, it's not scholars who now think an alternative view. So scholars have not been mentioned. There is a little bit of a, a, something a little off here. Let's see if we can find a better option. Option two states, since its origin, language has been continuously evolving to higher forms from being used to identify objects to ensuring human survival by enabling our ancestors to bond and cooperate. We see here, since its origin, language has been continuously evolving to higher forms. This is a distortion. Language has not been continuously evolving. In fact, it is not about language at all. It is about the hypotheses relating to the dominant view relating to language, the original view and the alternative newer view. So two is clearly incorrect. It's a distortion. We can eliminate option two. Option three states, experts are challenging the narrow view of the origin of language as being merely used to describe facts and label objects to being necessary to promote more complex interactions among humans. This is also definitely a distortion. It is not experts who are challenging the narrow view. The dominant hypothesis still is that language evolved to allow humans to exchange factual information. But an alternative view is also now rising that language evolved in order to facilitate social bonding. So there's absolutely no reference to experts challenging anything at all. So this is also clearly a distortion. We can eliminate option three. Option four states, most believe that language ori uh, originated from a need to articulate facts, but others think it emerged from the need to promote social cohesion and cooperation, thus enabling human survival. Now this option is perfect. We can see most believe refers to the dominant hypotheses believe that language originated from a need to articulate facts, uh, allow humans to exchange factual information, but others think so an alternative view is that language evolved from the need to promote social cohesion and cooperation. We see social bonding and cooperation mentioned here, thus enabling human survival. These were important so that our ancestors' chance of survival can be increased. So we find that option four is perfect. It covers most of the key areas. So we can qualify option four. When we have such distinct and such direct connections, we don't need the inferences in option one. So we can eliminate option one. The best summary is option four. Statement one says, you can observe the truth of this in every e-business model ever constructed. Monopolize and protect data. Statement two says, economists and technologists believe that a new kind of capitalism is being created, different from industrial capitalism as well as merchant capitalism. Now there's something out of uh, out of sync over here. One and two are quite different, unless there's something that connects the aspect of e-business model and monopolizing and protecting data to capitalism, we might have our odd statement in these two. Statement three says, in 1962, Kenneth Arrow, the guru of mainstream economics, said that in a free market economy, the purpose of inventing things is to create intellectual property rights. Four says, there is alongside the world of monopolized information and surveillance, a different dynamic growing up. Information as a social good, incapable of being owned or exploited or prized. And then five says, yet information is abundant. Information goods are freely rep are replicable. Once a thing is made, it can be copied and pasted infinitely. So we finally realized that we were right. The other statements, they connect with one. And so two would be our odd statement. So what we have here is 
First, in one, we have observed the truth of this in every e-business model ever constructed. Monopolize and protect data. Keyword, data. We are talking about information here. So this connects with the aspect of data. Next up, we have three, which says in 16, 1962, Kenneth Arrow, the guru of mainstream economics, said that in a free market economy, the purpose of inventing things is to create intellectual property rights again intellectual property rights is brain product a product of of the mind so here we could also see that invention connects with in in this sense inventing things connects with uh, the idea of data again going further we have four which says there's alongside the world of monopolized information and surveillance a different dynamic growing up information as a social good incapable of being owned or exploited or prized so yet again we've come to information information the key aspect of this statement five says yet information is abundant information goods are freely replicable once the thing is made it can be copied and pasted infinitely so yet again we can remove this this statement from our consideration now finally we come to option uh, statement two Economists and technologists believe that a new kind of capitalism is being created, different from industrial capitalism as, as was uh, merchant capitalism. Now, in this, we see the key aspect is not even economists and technologists. While there are economists and technologists, uh, understandable, understand, not directly mentioned probably, but we can infer that there is economics and technology involved here yes sure why not but that is not the key aspect believe that a new kind of capitalism is being created so the key aspect here is capitalism and there's nothing else which connects with capitalism doesn't make any sense so we might say that there is a very sketchy connection between uh, between this and the fact that information is abundant goods are freely replicable one thing is made, it can be copied and pasted. And world of monopolized information and surveillance, a different dynamic is growing up. Information is a social good incapable of being owned or exploited or, or prized. We don't need to check with this. The key aspect, yet again, would, would in all of this be information. And two does not talk about information. So clearly two is radically different from the, uh, from the rest of the statements. So we can qualify two as an odd statement. We can eliminate one, three, four, and five. And thus our answer is two. Statement one says, the victim's trauma after assault rarely gets the attention that we lavish on the moment of damage that divided the survivor from a less encumbered past. Two says, one thing we often do with narratives of sexual assault is sort their uh, respective parties into different temporalities. It seems we are interested in perpetrators, perpetrators' futures and victims' pasts. Three says, one result is that we don't have much of a vocabulary for what happens in a victim's life after the painful past has been excavated, even when our shared language gestures towards the future as the term survivor does. Four says, even the most charitable questions asked about the victim, victims seems to focus, seem to focus on the past in pursuit of understanding or of corroboration of painful details. And five says, as more and more stories of sexual assault have been made public in the last two years, the genre of their telling has exploded. Crimes have, ten have a tendency to become not just stories, but genres. So at first glance, this can be very, very difficult and very confusing as to which one is, uh, is the odd statement because all of the statements connect. So we'll find that we'll actually have to resort to. Now, if we, if we find the reference, then this question becomes comparatively slightly easier. It's not that difficult a reference, but... To find the reference, we'll have to resort to doing connections. Connections because, because otherwise we'll not be able to see that one of the statements is out of out of place. Usually it is it is a waste of time to 
build connections or unjumble the the given statements uh, in a in an odd statement question but in questions as difficult as this or as confusing as this might be necessary so we find that five begins the sequence stating as more and more stories of sexual assault have been made public in the last two years the genre of their telling has exploded crimes have a tendency to become not just stories but genres so this introduces the aspect of the crime of sexual assault and says that this particular genre of crime has exploded it has it has become very popular increasingly popular because crimes have a tendency to become not just stories but genres so five is the opening statement then we see that we have next up uh, the statement uh, the statement two coming in so we say one thing we often do with the narratives of sexual assault so narratives of sexual assault directly connecting with stories of sexual assault is sort their respective parties into different temporalities it seems we are interested in perpetrators futures and victims is pass so now we have the term perpetrators and victims introduced so perpetrators victims victims is something that we'll see in the remaining statements all through next up we get the aspect of the victim's trauma and that will introduce in 3 3 begins this by stating one result is that we don't have much of a vocabulary for what happens in a victim's life after the painful past has been excavated basically this is talking about the incident of assault when they were assaulted after that what happens what trauma do they undergo what happens in the victim's lives we don't have much of a vocabulary to to assess to analyze or even process that even when our shared language gestures towards the future as the term survivor does we don't look towards the future and then this this idea is further assessed and probably drawn to a conclusion we could say in statement one the victim's trauma after assault rarely gets the attention that we lavish on the moment of damage that divided the survivor from a less encumbered past so we see that after the term survivor is introduced in uh, uh, in statement three we have the uh, the word in quotations in statement three it is further mentioned it is further assessed in statement one so finally we we realize that all of these statements thus uh, one two three and five are in connection now with this insight if we look at four four tells us even the most charitable questions about the victims seem to focus on the past in pursuit of understanding of or corroboration of painful details but this is something that has completely been obviated in statements one and three statement two which says yes the we are interested in the victim's past might seem to connect with this but there is a definite step down between these two statements and then we have one and three, which we saw in the sequence that come in and say that we don't have a vocabulary for what happens in the victim's life. We don't have the uh, the uh, the ability to assess what kind of trauma they have been through. The victim's trauma after the assault rarely gets the attention. After all of that, to say that even the most charitable questions asked to victims, they they try to assess. The, they, they focus on the victim's past and they pursue to understand or corroborate the painful details of the victim's past is incorrect because the only thing that we we take into account is the moment of the incident of assault after that what trauma they go through that is that does that usually does not concern us in this trivialization that crimes have become stories we forget all that trauma so we realize that it's actually four which is the most different from the other statements the one that doesn't belong so we can eliminate statements one two three and five we could connect them into a premise four is sufficiently different from the other statements hence our answer is four statement one says but the attention of the layman not surprisingly has been captured by the atom bomb although 
there is at least a chance that it may never be used again. Statement 2 says, Of all the changes introduced by man into the household of nature, controlled large-scale nuclear fission is undoubtedly the most dangerous and most profound. Statement 3 says, The danger to humanity created by the so-called peaceful uses of atomic energy may however be much greater. And then 4 says, the resultant ionizing radiation has become the most serious agent of pollution of the environment and the greatest threat to man's survival on earth. So we can first off, right off the bat, see two connections forming. The first connection is between two and four. Two introduces the premise. It says, of all the changes introduced by man into the household of nature, Controlled large-scale nuclear fission is undoubtedly the most dangerous and most profound. Most dangerous, at least that part, is given reference to in 4. 4 brings us the reasoning why this assertion has been made. 4 says, the resultant ionizing radiation has become the most serious agent of pollution of the environment and the greatest threat to man's survival on Earth. So we find that there is first a pair in two and four, of which in which two would come first because it introduces the premise, and four would come would would follow two because it gives a reasoning for the assertion made in two. By the looks of it, two might also be our opening statement. Next up, we see one and three. And we find that there's a connection between one and three also forming. But the attention of the layman, the common man, not surprisingly, has been captured by the atom bomb, although there is at least a chance that it may never be used again. And then D says, uh, three says, the danger to humanity created by the so-called peaceful uses of atomic energy may, however, be much greater. Why does this connect or how does this connect? Peaceful uses of atomic energy may, however, be greater. This basically qualifies that it follows one which says captured by the atom bomb. So atom bomb, the bomb is, a, it's, it's a weapon. So the weaponized, used, uh, the weaponized use of uh, atomic energy is that which captures the common man's attention. Not surprisingly, as statement one says, but there is a chance that atom bombs may never be used again because they are bombs. They are used in specific situations. However, the so-called peaceful uses of atomic energy may be the dangers of, um, of the so-called peaceful, peaceful uh, uses of atomic energy may be much greater. So we find that there's another pair in one and three. Of these two pairs, we can clearly see that two, four would come first because we have two introducing the entire central aspect, the, the key aspect of nuclear energy, nuclear fission. And from the, uh, from the opening phrase of all the changes introduced by man into the household of nature, the one that is undoubtedly the most dangerous is this. So we can see that two is clearly introductory. Between four and one, we also have a step down because we might have had two, one, four, three as a possible pair, but that doesn't work because between four and one, we get a clear step. Two and four are immediately connected. Two and one, not so much because four gives us the reason why this is most uh, most uh, dangerous. Following one, the atom bomb doesn't connect with the resultant ionizing radiation, has become the most serious agent of pollution of the environment and the greatest threat. The atom bomb doesn't wouldn't wouldn't be talking about the resultant ionizing radiation. The atom bomb, its result is quite clear. It devastates. 
a mushroom cloud. Everything is gone, vaporized. So we find that we cannot have two, one, four, three, because two, four are clearly related. If we have four, one, the resultant ionizing, ionizing radiation has become the most serious agent of pollution and the greatest threat to man's survival on earth. However, the common man pays attention, pays more attention to the atom bomb. And then we have one and three connecting as well. So we realize that there is no breaking of this order. We'll exactly have these pairs, two, four, and one, three, of which two, four would come first. That means that our sequence has two as the opening statement. Then we have four as the second statement. Then we have one as the third. And then we have three as the fourth statement. Thus, we get our answer sequence as 2, 4, 1, 3. So what we have here is, um, thankfully and much surprisingly, uh, a rather straightforward question. When things come to the, to the shove of it, we'll find that we actually need to process only one statement, which is a bit of a floater. Let's read the statements first. One says, it also has four movable auxiliary telescopes, 1.8 meters in diameter. Two says, completed in 2006, the very large telescope, VLT, has four reflecting telescopes, 8.2 meters in diameter, that can observe objects four billion times weaker than can normally be seen with the naked eye. Three says, this configuration enables one to distinguish an astronaut on the moon. And then four says, when these are combined with the large telescopes, they produce what is called inferometry, uh, interferometry, a simulation of the power of a mirror 16 meter in diameter and the resolution of a telescope of 200 meters. So first off, we can clearly see that statement two introduces the premise saying completed in 2006, the very large telescope has four reflecting telescopes, 8.2 meters in diameter, and so on and so on. Then we see, so we see that two is an, uh, two is an introductory statement. So in all probability, we'll have two as the opening statement. Next up, we have one and four, which form a connection. So we see that one says it also has four movable auxiliary telescopes, 1.8 meters in diameter. Uh, why is this after two? Because also has, and two says that this telescope, the VLT has, so has also, ha uh, also has. So we'll have one following two. Now we don't know if it immediately follows two. So let's put one over here. And then we see that one forms a pair with four, because if we if we uh, analyze four, we'll find that this is talking about this exact connection. When these are combined with the large telescopes, they produce what is called interferometry, a simulation of the power of a mirror 16 meters in diameter and the resolution of a telescope of 200 meters. When these combine, what would com combine? These reflecting telescopes, the ones that are mentioned here in two, four reflecting telescopes, and then the ones that are mentioned in one auxiliary, four movable auxiliary telescopes, when these combine. So we definitely have four as a resultant of two and one, or in other words, four follows two and one. So four in our sequence comes after one because two is the opening st statement, as we can see. Let's clear these statements out because otherwise it'll cause a clutter. Now we see that we are only left with three. Unfortunately, three is a floater. So three says this configuration enables one to distinguish an astronaut on the moon to be diligent, we'll put a two over here. Because we find that this configuration could be talking about 
any one of these statements. It could, could be talking about the configuration of the four reflecting telescopes. It could be talking about the configuration of the four auxiliary telescopes. It could be talking about the configuration of the com combination of these telescopes and the production of in interferometry. So technically speaking, we could have three over here between two and one or over here between one and four or over here at the end after two, one and four. Let's check these one at a time. So first we are checking with two, three and one. Completed in 2006, the very large telescope. So far, so far, not a problem. Ob objects four, four billion times weaker than can normally be seen with the naked eye. This configuration enables one to distinguish an astronaut on the moon. It also has four movable auxiliary telescopes. Now this causes a rift. We cannot have this configuration. It also has four movable auxiliary telescopes. What then that would mean is that the configuration has four movable auxiliary telescopes, which makes no sense. The telescope has four movable auxil auxiliary telescopes, not the configuration. So we cannot have 3, 1, 3, 1 cannot be qualified. Hence, 3 cannot be placed between 2 and 1. Moving further, let's check with 1, 3, 4. In this, we realize it also has four movable auxiliary telescopes, 1.8 meters in diameter. This configuration enables one to distinguish an astronaut on the moon. Perfect. When these are combined with the large, with the large telescopes, when these are combined with the large telescopes, what? the configuration or the astronaut. These cannot at all follow this statement, cannot at all follow three, because three has configuration, singular, astronaut, singular, moon, singular. So these is not mentioned at all. So yet again, we see that we cannot have three between one and four. So this can be eliminated, which gives us that we must have three at the end. So if we check this, we'll find four says when these are combined, which is perfect because two introduces the VLT and then says it has four reflecting telescopes. One says also has also has four movable auxiliary telescopes. Four says when these are combined with large telescopes, they produce what is called interferometry, a simulation of the power of a mirror of 16 meters and resolution of a telescope of 200 meters and such. This configuration, this uh, this power level of a mirror 16 meters in diameter and resolution of a telescope of 200 meters enables one to distinguish an astronaut on the moon, which is just perfect. So we can qualify three as being at the end. Thus we get the sequence after two, which is the opening statement. We have one, which comes in as the second statement. Then we have four, which comes in as the third. And then finally, we have three, our little troublemaker here at the end. So we get our final sequence, answer sequence as two, one, four, three. That is our answer. Statement one says, while you might think that you see or are aware of all the changes that happen in your immediate environment, there's simply too much information for your brain to fully process everything. Notice the word brain here for your brain. Statement two says, psychologists use the term change blindness to describe this tendency of people to be blind to changes, though they are in the immediate environment. Statement three says, it cannot be aware of every single thing that happens in the world around you. And then four says, sometimes big shifts happen in front of your eyes and you are not at all aware of these changes. Now, this is a very complex question because to, to be able to analyze at such closeness, there's only one way out of, of answering this. Hold on to that thought and we'll come back to it in just a moment. Let's make a few connections first. Let's build a few connections first. We have highlighted the word brain here. We can see that it directly connects with the word it because three could otherwise not connect with anything. Psychologists try, try connecting three with 
two and four will not be able to do so. Psychologists use the term change blindness. We are we are reading through statement two to describe this tendency of people to be blind to changes, though they are in the immediate environment. Psychologists cannot be con cannot be termed as it. And then we have four which says four which says sometimes big shifts happen in front of your eyes. And you are not at all aware of these changes. Again, changes plural, so it could not connect with changes. So what it connects with effectively is your brain. And since it would come later, so we first off get there is a pair in one three. Good enough, easy enough. Now, if we look at two and four, we'll find that by essence there is again a pair in two and four. So we can see here that. Uh, two says, psychologists use the term change blindness to describe this tendency of people to be blind to changes, though they are in the immediate environment. And we see that four also talks about something similar to this. Sometimes big shifts happen in front of your eyes, and you're not at all aware of these changes. So in front of your eyes, changes happening in front of your eyes. And Bl being blind to changes that uh, that are in the immediate environment. These also form a connection. And we see that because two says uh, this tendency, this tendency must be referring to something. So this tendency, the statement that it is referring to, we can understand is four. So we have, as we find another pair in four and two. 4 coming in first because 2 refers to 4 with the phrase this tendency. But the convenience of forming connections and being able to forge through this through trick work stops right here. Now let's come back to that thought. We have two floater pairs 1, 3 and 4, 2. At first glance, if we look through the statement, reading them in sequence will not get us anywhere because while 1, 3, 4, 2 we'll find is a potential choice. So is 4, 2, 1, 3. Because there's no direct connection between these two pairs. Neither can we, can we build a connection between 1 and 2, nor can we build a connection between 3 and 4. So in any way, we cannot check. What comes to our aid is the idea of the general to specific rule. That golden rule, which is maintained over here, we'll find that it is one three that will come first because one talks about changes aware of all the changes so when we say changes we are talking about all changes all the changes directly mentioned here comparatively four is something more specific because here we are talking about big shifts or big changes and that too sometimes not always while you might think you see or are aware of all changes that happen in your immediate environment Sometimes big shifts happen in front of your eyes. So one is talking about changes in general and the brain's ability to fully process these changes. Four talks about a very specific scenario. Sometimes large changes happen in front of your eyes and you're still not able, able to see them. So we find that in whatever sequence we have, the sequence that, that we need to get here, one must be there before we have four, or one must come before four, one must precede four. So that makes things easy. Finally, we can, we can start building our sequence. So if we have to have one first, then the pair one, three would come first, which means the beginning will have statement one, which will be followed by statement three, which is the second statement, and then we'll have four. So then we'll have the pair four, two, which means that next we'll have statement four coming in as a third statement. And then we'll have statement two coming in as the fourth statement. So we finally get our answer sequence, final answer sequence as one, three, four, two. That is our answer.